Welcome back to Iowa in Focus. We're joined now at the University of Iowa campus by Professor Nicholas Grossman, uh, talking a little bit about ISIS and what we look at right now, and obviously the attacks last week in Paris. Were you surprised by that kind of thing? ISIS is obviously known for their violence in a lot of different ways, but not in a city like Paris. A little surprised, but not too much. Uh, to be honest, I'm almost surprised that something like this hasn't happened before for two reasons. One, after the Mumbai attacks in 2008, we saw that groups of teams with machine guns and explosives hitting multiple targets at once within a city is extremely difficult to stop. And the other reason is because a lot of people from Europe, especially a lot of people from France, have been traveling to Syria, traveling to Iraq to fight with ISIS. And we knew that ISIS was interested in attacking Western targets. You mentioned that it's hard to, uh, hard to fight back against that kind of coordinated attack. Mm -hmm. How is this and how does that represent the new face of kind of warfare in the 21st century where you don't have two nation state actors on a mm -hmm. battlefield declaring that this is the start of a battle? Uh, it's a completely different look to violence in the 21st century. Right. Almost all 21st century wars, especially the ones that have threatened the most powerful countries like the United States or some of the European countries um, or Russia, have been asymmetric. It's been a smaller group of non-state actors who are able to sneak through the defenses that the stronger states have in order to execute an attack. The other thing that's different about this one, <coughs> the other thing that's different about this one is Al-Qaeda would usually focus on symbolic targets. So they would hit transportation networks, like using planes for 9-11, a symbolic target like the World Trade Center or the Pentagon, or Al-Qaeda-linked attacks like uh, the Madrid train station bombings in 2003, or the London subway and uh, bus bombing in 2005. And ISIS seems willing to go to basically any soft target where people are. And so defending against Al-Qaeda meant protect symbolic targets, protect transportation hubs, but that gave security services something to focus on. And with ISIS, they seem willing to basically hit anywhere, and that becomes very difficult to stop because that would require such a police state that people wouldn't actually want to live under. That would be even worse. Not that you're trying to get into the mind of something that seems irrational because mm -hmm. that in itself is kind of irrational, but what's the emphasis behind that, behind uh, putting out these kind of open-ended calls to do whatever you can, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a very small attack that doesn't have a big, uh, you know, kind of mm -hmm. death toll or these bigger attacks, uh, which is kind of some of the messages that we've been hearing that they've been sending out through their networks. In part, ISIS is trying to establish a global brand. They want to give the sense to the small minority of disaffected Muslims, mostly young men, who want to feel like they're joining up into something bigger, that they can participate in this. It's almost like the activist slogan, think globally but act locally. That's what they're trying to encourage. And then by people doing these little things in different places, that also feeds their recruitment pitch. It gives them the sense that uh, ISIS is something that is bigger than just people who control a small area of Iraq and Syria. It's a global movement that you can join up. So it's basically the key to their recruiting. On that note, how high up the chain do we think something like Paris went? Obviously, in terms of success of an attack, this was a fairly successful one, a mm -hmm. high death toll, even more people injured. Um, is this something that maybe went to the highest parts of, of the ISIS hierarchy, or could this have been something that was just incredibly well orchestrated by a local actor? I think it's probably something in between. So it doesn't seem to be a carefully planned thing from the top like, say, 9-11 or the Mumbai attacks, where they were given specific orders, a plan worked out on top, and then waited until they got the orders to act. But it doesn't also seem, it also doesn't seem like self-starters, like, say, the Boston Marathon bombers, who took it upon themselves to do it. It seems like a hybrid of the two. So from the information we know now, it looks like some of the attackers were sent from Syria with orders to attack Paris without maybe very specific details of the plan, but a general idea, and also worked with some European citizens, people from Belgium and from France, to form the cell and then plan it out. But the fact that they used suicide vests in addition to machine guns indicates that it's more professional, not really amateur. It's hard to make those explosive devices and to not get hurt in the process and to be able to coordinate all the attacks at once. What does it mean that they are going over international borders now and going into other countries and not just focusing on the caliphate and the Islamic State and mm -hmm. setting up that, I guess, what has been a fairly uh, fluid 
uh, portion of land that they control between Iraq and Syria and, and over those two countries? Well, it means they're becoming more of a global threat, more of a global presence. So just in the last week, there were attacks against Paris and Beirut. Before that, there was the bombing of the Russian airliner over the Sinai, which was by an ISIS-linked group. Um, there were attacks in October also in Ankara, Turkey, by people suspected of being uh, linked to ISIS. And so that shows that their presence is growing. They also have gotten pledges of loyalty from a number of groups in many different locations, including uh, in Libya, in the Sinai, in Afghanistan, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria pledged allegiance to ISIS. So this gives them a almost like a franchise model. So in the same way you have, say, Subway or McDonald's, a local person uh, gets a McDonald's franchise, they get the benefit of having, having all those McDonald's commercials on TV, and the greater brand, the central brand, gets the benefit of having all of these sandwich shops with their name on it instead of just anyone. So um, by ISIS having this model, they still have their core in the area that they're calling a caliphate in Iraq and Syria. But they also have all of these other people that are like their franchises in other places. And that gives the sense of a greater global presence, which helps their recruitment and helps make their targets more afraid of them, which is their goal. On that note, then, I mean, this may seem like it's uh, callous, but mm -hmm. what about brand control? They were talking about having 24-hour, you know, like 24-7 like helplines for people mm -hmm. to call in and get help with what they're trying to plan. How do they make sure that all these different factions of, uh, you know, kind of stay on point and don't represent them in a, in a bad way, if that can exist? They don't which is the interesting part about it. So Al-Qaeda was pretty strict about who they would allow in. In fact, one of the reasons why ISIS ended up splintering off of Al-Qaeda is because Al-Qaeda Central really didn't like them beheading Muslims, especially even, uh, say, you know, Muslims, uh, they're, they're Sunni, but even Shia Muslims, let alone Sunnis that they think are insufficiently religious. And because Al-Qaeda believed, that makes us look bad. You know, from Al-Qaeda's perspective, they wanted to claim that they were representing all Muslims, and if they're killing Muslims, that doesn't work as well. From ISIS's perspective, they have a much looser standard, and they seem to just be more interested in looking like they can have an impact rather than specifically what that impact can be. So for them, it seems like they've made a trade-off where even though they have less central control, they end up having more participants because they have lower standards, and that makes them seem bigger. Does it matter that uh, it seems like Abud has been killed now in this raid uh, just north of, of Paris? Uh, it seems like the French are kind of pushing this, but given that model where you have this kind of franchisee network, uh, is that as big a deal as some people might think it is, even though he is being credited as being the mastermind of these attacks? Um, it's not nothing, but it's not that big a deal either. So for anybody who was killed in the attack, perhaps they feel some small solace from the fact that the person who planned it uh, is not going to be able to do it again and um, was stopped. At the same time, it also means that he won't be able to plan a future attack. And he obviously proved himself to be good at it and to be dangerous. And this wasn't the first time that uh, he's been suspected of planning attack. But at the same time, he's hardly the only one that works for ISIS and certainly not the only one who sympathizes with their cause. So removing him removes a small part of the threat, but not all that much of it. Maybe on the same note in terms of uh, kind of we saw this coming, but uh, we just saw this morning that branches of ISIS are looking at wanting to develop chemical weapons mm -hmm. from Iraqi intelligence. Um, I mean, first off, does that come as a big surprise? And what does that mean if you have all these different kinds of groups planning even small attacks? A small chemical weapons attack would be a big deal. Right. That could be really devastating. And especially in an enclosed pl space like, say, a subway or a... Uh, an arena, some sort of like a sports arena indoors. Right. But terrorists have been looking for chemical weapons or even more powerful weapons basically for the entire 21st century, if, you know, if not earlier. And thus far, they haven't really been able to get them, mostly because it's hard. So terrorism in general is hard, that there are a lot more failed plots, a lot of ways that people who wanted to do it weren't able to pull it off. And even being in the mental capacity to plan something, to uh, work it out, to think about it, to both not uh, tip off anybody and also to be willing to carry through is not easy. And so it's much more common to see low-tech attacks kind of like with, uh, say, guns right. um, or even lower-tech explosives 
rather than something that's more complex, like a chemical weapon or even, say, a radiological weapon, because there are a lot of ways it can go wrong. It's hard to construct a delivery device for it. It's possible that, say, somebody with a, attempting a gas attack just poisons themselves rather than um, really kills the people that they want to. So since it's much easier to get guns, and uh, getting guns and getting small explosives can make about as devastating an impact, usually that's what they tend towards. What is the backlash from uh, just the way that the uh, Muslim community around the world is treated now? Mm -hmm. You see it in the United States dealing with Syrian refugees. You see it in Europe on, on the same token. France mm -hmm. closed its borders in the hours after the attack happened. Um, how does that work to uh, ISIS's advantage to essentially turn the world against Muslims and then the reaction that those Muslims have towards the rest of the world too? It's very valuable to them. Um, I'd say it's actually a central part of their strategy. So France closing its borders was mostly security. They wanted to make sure that anybody who was fleeing after executing the attack couldn't get out of the country. But the negative reaction in the United States, in Europe, towards Syrian refugees is giving ISIS exactly what they want. So one of the main assets that the United States has in a war of ideas against jihadist ideology is that we are a open, welcoming, pluralistic society, that we believe in things like freedom of religion and human rights and universal values. And to the extent that we communicate to the world that, no, not really, or not in the case of Muslims, we're taking a bunch of people who are victims of ISIS and making their lives even worse. And that feeds directly into ISIS's propaganda. They're trying to argue that the United States hates Muslims and that they're the real representatives of Islam, and so therefore all Muslims need to fight for them. And that resonates with such a tiny percentage of the world's Muslims at the moment. And the more that we feed into it, the more that we help them in their propaganda pitch. What is your, or what is the effect, though, on the, you know, Muslim who lives in New York City and who's mm -hmm. a small business owner, or the Muslim who lives in Iowa or Chicago, and who's so far from being radicalized, but is, feels the backlash of this. Is, I mean, is there a point where you drive reasonable people and sensible people all the way to that extreme, or do they end up coming down somewhere in the middle? How does that generally play out? I doubt that you drive them all the way to that extreme. Right. That the it's the people on the margins, the ones that could be recruited by ISIS but are thinking maybe but no are the ones that we should be afraid of kind of being pushed over the edge. I think most of the people that you just described, you know, say just like some Muslim guy who owns a store in the middle of Iowa um, or, you know, New York City, wherever else, uh, it's just we'll have to perhaps deal with a little persecution. And uh, that's, you know, hard for them, but... As you said, if they're reasonable people, they're not about to go and join a terrorist group because of this. What does the future look like for ISIS in terms of what it wants out of the Islamic State, what it wants to call the caliphate? Mm -hmm. um, does it want a patch of land, or does it kind of want this fluidness of constantly fighting for borders and taking and losing cities? And um, I guess what does success look like in, in their eyes? Both. It wants both. So... ISIS wants, ultimately, they have very strong absolutist goals, which is to create a large caliphate and have a final confrontation with the rest of the world and win. And they have some prophecies that they can point to that that's going to happen. That's a pretty outlandish goal, and I think that their more realistic strategists realize that it won't happen. So what they mostly want is to create a patch of land that they can call a caliphate, and to make it grow, especially in areas that are predominantly Muslim, that have governments that are run by people who are Muslims, but who ISIS believes are apostates or insufficiently religious. And so I think probably their realistic ideal is to carve out a genuine state in a lot of Iraq and Syria, maybe all of it, maybe expand it into places like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, even Egypt. And control that land and use it as a base of operations. That's the thing that makes ISIS different from al-Qaeda, really from any terrorist group that we've seen so far, is that they have this thing that they can call a state. And it's not a real state, but having one gives them a sense that they're winning, that uh, they're fulfilling the prophecy, or just that they are actually able to do this when so many people are trying to stop them. And that fuels their recruiting. That makes it that people think that they're joining a winner instead of a group that is hiding in caves. And at a certain point, though, they do become a state. They pick up the trash. They perform government mm -hmm. duties and things like that. So, I mean, 
at, at that point they kind of achieve statehood or is there is there another step that they'll still always be short of because of the nature of what what it is so doing some governing doesn't mean you're a state that okay. there are a lot of groups that do that in different areas so um, for example, the Tamil Tigers did in part of Sri Lanka. Uh, Hezbollah does government-like functions in southern Lebanon. To be a state, you need things like control of borders, international recognition, um, and other elements. So I don't think they'll ever really be a state. If somehow they manage to hold territory for many decades and really keep and hold borders, then maybe they would force people to recognize them. But I doubt that anybody ever really would. And uh, I don't even think they could be able to hold that much territory for that long. Wow. Anything you think we missed or anything else? Uh, so just one, one when you yeah. mentioned on the refugees. Sure. Uh, the 9-11 attackers all came to the United States on a combination of tourist, business, and student visas. Okay. And at the time, the United States didn't call for an end to tourism and business travel and uh, students from abroad. And uh, President Bush, in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, was very adamant that the United States is a welcoming country and has respect for all of the world's religions and that we have citizens of all different religions in the United States and of none and that right. we officially respect all of them. And it's a pretty dramatic change to go from uh, the president saying those things to seeing a lot of uh, people, including candidates for president, saying basically the opposite. It feels outright xenophobic. Um, I mean, on on its face. What does that mean, though? To and, and, and like you said, it's a walking back of some ideas that are mm -hmm. pretty inherently American. So, um, yeah, I think it's mostly driven by fear, and fear can sometimes make people irrational. Uh, in some sense, it's both mischaracterizing the uh, refugees themselves in that anybody who comes to the United States or anybody who's already in the United States, there's a tiny percent chance that they're going to be a terrorist. And, you know, just recently this year, uh, the most deadly terrorist attack on the United States was uh, Dylan Roof attacking the South Carolina church. And so there's no particular reason to think that a group of Syrian refugees are more dangerous than any of the other groups we allow in for other reasons. And we have screening procedures put in place. Everybody who comes in is fingerprinted. Um, everybody's interviewed. And then a lot of people are monitored by intelligence agencies, by the FBI, uh, by Homeland Security. Uh, and then there's the difficulty of them having to actually pull off a terrorist attack if they wanted to. And so the risk is really tiny, but the damage to American strategy in terms of trying to counter ISIS's propaganda is considerably greater. So I think it's natural for people to be fearful in the aftermath of an attack, but it's important to remember that ISIS really can't do that much physical damage to America or to the West in general. If it, uh, any of the kind of wealthier, more powerful countries outside of the Middle East, that what they can do, however, is psychological damage, and we are also capable of resisting that. Do you think there will eventually be a sobering effect in, uh, you know, walking back from some of the, the rhetoric we're hearing now into understanding that, okay, well, it probably is the right thing to bring in uh, a lot of Syrian refugees because they need the space, and, uh, you know, not all of them are going to be terrorists? I think so, probably. Um, in the uh, 1930s, 1940s, there was a lot of fear over Japanese Americans. They would be loyal to Japan. The United States put them in internment camps and now looks back on that as an embarrassment. Um, also in uh, the later 1930s, 1940s, the United States turned away Jewish refugees from Europe on the grounds that they might be communists. Right. And that's something that we look back on and don't look back on fondly. And I think probably the same will be the case here that so far since 9-11, the United States has allowed in, I think it's something in the range of 750,000 people from the Middle East who have committed zero terrorist attacks and uh, not even been arrested for trying to plan one. So the numbers are pretty clear that a few guys who managed to sneak into Paris doesn't mean that a bunch of victims of ISIS are going to come to the United States and try to kill people.